Amen. John chapter 12 today, we're preaching through the book of John, and we're going to pick up in verse number 33, where we left off last week, and read for just a little while. This he said, signifying what death he should die. That in verse 32, where he'd be lifted up, and we preached about being drawn to Christ. Last week, verse 34, the people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whether he goeth. Now I'm going to tell you, I'd underline that. If you're here today and you're lost, you are walking in darkness and you do not know where you're headed or you would turn. You would turn to Jesus Christ. Verse 36, while you have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That's key now. Verse 38, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed. That's in Isaiah chapter 53. Verse 39, therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said, said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. This talking about the nation of Israel, these Jewish people that Jesus was literally speaking to here, who he was in the midst of at this time. And you can read about that in Romans chapter 9 and 11 and 12, that the Jewish people to this day still have a blindness. They have a veil upon them uh, so the Gentiles could be grafted in. And that's a whole other subject. But he said, and with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. These things, verse 41 said, Isaiah, when he saw his glory, which is in Isaiah chapter 6, you can read about that, and spake of him. Verse 42, nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, this is interesting, watch this. Among the chief rulers also, many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Mark verse 43, I'm not preaching on it, but you need to get this great biblical truth. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. They like the praise of both. They just wanted men's praise more. This is a great trap. This is a great hindrance. This is a great stumbling thing that men get caught up in. They want people to like them. And, but they want, God to, uh, they, they want God to like them too. But they, they want the praise of men more than the praise of God. And that directs their life. Verse 44, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. This is uh, verses on the deity of Jesus Christ. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. If any man hear my words and believe not, are you listening? Here it is. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Now, in John chapter 3, where Jesus speaks to Nicodemus about being born again, he said, I came not to condemn the world. He said, the world's condemned already. He said, I came to save the world. The first time Jesus came, he came not to judge or condemn, but to save. That was the purpose of his coming. But the second time he comes, he will come to judge. And that's he mentions in the next verse, verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words. Now listen, this is not idle reading. None of the Bible is. But you sure better put the brakes on and pay attention to the signs here. He is telling the world and telling these people, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. I want, to, I want you to take your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20 to the scene that Jesus is referring to judgment of the last day of those who rejected him. I realized this morning that, and I hope that I'm preaching to a saved audience. I pray that be the case. But you know, if there was one person in this church house today that's not saved, one person that ever listens to this message that's not saved, it would be worth it to preach this message because this is just as much Bible as John 3, 16. Revelation chapter 20, verse number 11. Is everybody there? Say amen. And this is the word of God. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. 
and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12 that the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That it divides asunder of the marrow of the bone and the spirit and the soul and all these things. It literally goes to the deepest part of who a man is. And it searches him out. Jesus said back in John chapter 12 that he said, you have one that's going to judge you. He said, I came to save you. But he said, if you reject me and you reject my words, you'll have something or someone that will judge you. And that is the word of God, the words that this Bible. The Bible said in 1 John chapter 5, there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And what Jesus Christ is telling these people this, that if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, His death, His burial, and His resurrection for the salvation of your soul, for the forgiveness of sin, that there is nothing left for you and that you will be judged at the last day at the great white throne judgment and you will receive judgment for your works in your life and there will be a place that you'll go to. This passage of scripture is the most sobering and the most serious words that you'll ever hear when you read that somebody was cast into the lake of fire forever. There is nothing I've ever heard. There's nothing I've ever read. There's nothing you ever hear or read that is more sober than the words that you just read where a person stands before God Almighty having been a rejecter of Jesus Christ and hears the words, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And whenever God tells the angels, Cast this person into the lake of fire forever and ever, you have never seen a horror story You have never read a horror story. You've never seen a movie. You've never heard anything that will match what the scene that you just read when someone, not a fictitious deal, not some made-up story, but literally when every lost human being of the world stands before a just, holy, righteous God, having rejected their own salvation, rejected Jesus Christ, are judged according to what their life has been, and are cast into the lake of fire. You have never been anything around anything like that in your life. This is the most serious and sober words you've ever heard. There's three things that you need to know today. Number one is that God is. There is a God. The Bible doesn't start out trying to explain himself. God just said, in the beginning, God. And God takes it for granted that anybody can understand there is a God. There is a creator behind the creation. The Bible said that nature reveals there is a God. Your spirit knows there's a God. The second thing, not only you need to know that there is a God, you need to know that God has spoken. That God has spoken. And He has spoken through His Word. The old song says, What more can He say than to you He has said? And the Bible talks about miracles. And Jesus said, Listen, you'll do well to read the Bible. And to know what God has said to you. And if you want to know what God has said to you, read your Bible. God is. Secondly, God has spoken through His Word. But number three, you need to know this. Not only God is, that God has spoken. But you and I are going to be brought into judgment concerning what God has spoken. It is appointed, the Bible said in Hebrews 9, 27. It is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. I'm going into judgment. You're going into judgment. You're going to die and you're going to face God Almighty. And you're going to give an account for your life. Now I don't have time this morning to go into the different judgments that there are in the Bible. But there are several. One of the judgments is that when Jesus Christ was judged with our sins on the cross. He took our sin upon the cross and was judged there at the cross. That's what he's talking about early in the chapter. When he said the prince of this world is judged. 
and will be cast out. He is saying, I am taking the judgment of God, the wrath of God. When I'm lifted up on that tree, I'll take that judgment for you. But if you reject that judgment, then in verse 48, there's no judgment left for you except that that judgment of the last day of those who rejected Jesus. There is the judgment of the nations uh, about Israel. The Bible speaks of that in Matthew. There is the self-judgment of a Christian. He's to examine himself at the communion table. There is the judgment of Christian people before the judgment seat of Christ. It's not a... By the way... The judgments after death is not about whether you're going to be saved or not. That's decided here. The judgments are according to your works, either as a Christian or as a lost person. It is not a judgment about you're already condemned. You're already judged lost. You're already judged guilty. That, that's the way it is. Jesus said, I didn't need to come down to judge you. You're already judged. You're guilty. But what you're seeing at this great white throne judgment is the sentencing and the evidence for the judgment. You have the judgment of Christians. It's often called the Bema Seat Judgment, where we stand before the judgment seat of Christ and are judged as Christians what we did with our life here and our time serving the Lord. Then there's the judgment of the great white throne, which is a judgment of the dead lost, the unsaved people for all time. And the Bible is very clear here that those people are brought before God And they're judged according to their works. By the way, if you want to try to go to heaven by your works, go ahead. You'll find out the judgment, your works came up short. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We do not measure up. Let me say first of all what this judgment that you just read about in Revelation 20 is not. It is not a judgment of the redeemed or saved people. If you are truly born again of the Spirit of God, you are not going to be at this judgment in a sense of being judged. I don't know this for sure. You may not even be here at all. But, I, you, but you may be there as witnesses. I do not know. The Bible's not clear on that as far as I'm concerned. But it is not a judgment for saved people. That's why I sung that song a while ago, and now I'm happy all the day. If I don't have anything, Brother Terry, to be happy about each day of my life, I'm not going to the lake of fire. I am not going to stand at the great white throne judgment because my sins have been judged in Jesus Christ. And because of what he did, not how good I am, not because of anything I've ever done or ever will do, but because of my faith in Jesus Christ, I'm not going to stand at the great white throne judgment and hear those words of being cast into the lake of fire. I'm not going. So I can be glad if everything else falls off the wagon. Amen? Now, so it's not a judgment for the redeemed. It is not a judgment to see if some folks are saved. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them the seed. It's not a judgment to see whether somebody's going to be saved or lost. That is not the case here. You find nobody in this whole judgment going to heaven and some going to the lake of fire. Everybody in this judgment goes to the lake of fire. So it's not a judgment to see where you'll wind up at. You're going to determine your destiny this side of the grave, not on the other side of the grave. What it is, this judgment is a judgment of the unsaved lost. Those who have been in hell already. Somebody says, do you ever get out of hell? Yes. You come out of hell one time, and that's to stand before the great white throne judgment, and then to be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. There is a difference between hell that now is, which is in the heart of this earth, and the lake of fire, which is somewhere out in eternity. Those are two separate places. None of this, what it is, none of those, as I said, go to heaven. This judgment that we read about that Jesus speaks of in John 12, is for those who have rejected salvation through the shed blood, the substitutionary sacrificial work of Jesus Christ, who are trusting in themselves or trusting in rituals, religion, or anything else, or trusting in nothing, who thought they didn't need God, didn't need a Savior, didn't need forgiveness. I'm going to tell you something. Donald Trump says, I've never asked forgiveness. That man doesn't repent and get saved. He's going to wind up exactly where he read about. And I don't care how much billions of dollars he's got. But I will tell you also that a homeless man sitting on the side of the road who doesn't have anything to spit in, much less money, if he doesn't repent and receive Jesus Christ, will also wind up in the lake of fire. That is not the issue. The issue is what have you done with the Lord Jesus Christ? That determines whether you're here or not. As I said, you're never going to read anything more sober and serious than this. Now you say, Reggie, I see what it isn't and I see what it is, but when is it? This judgment takes place before the eternal kingdom. 
What you have in the series of events now, we're in the church age. The next thing that count on the calendar of events is the rapture of the church or the first phase of the second coming of Jesus Christ when he will, the trump of God will sound, the dead in Christ shall be risen and will be changed and translated, caught up in the air with the Lord and so shall be with the Lord. Now, that is the next thing I believe scripturally is going to happen. After that, the tribulation period, the seven years of Jacob's trouble sets in. That will last for seven years. At the end of seven years, by the way, while that's going on in heaven, we will be at the judgment seat of Christ. We will be judged according to our works and rewarded eternally or loss of reward eternally at that time at the judgment seat of Christ. We'll also partake in the marriage supper of the Lamb uh, there in heaven. And we will come back with Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation and the battle of Armageddon and the nations of the world be gathered against Israel And then after that judgment of the nations and Christ establishes his kingdom there in Jerusalem for a thousand years. And that thousand year reign will be, and you can read about it in the Bible. I've preached on this several times, but after the thousand year reign, Satan during that thousand year reign is 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 in the bottomless pit. He'll be loose for a season and there'll be a brief war where he'll be defeated and thrown into the lake of fire. And then you have the end of this millennial period you have Christ Jesus, uh, this great white throne judgment. You read about that thousand-year period nine, uh, t- six times in the book, 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. And so at the end of the thousand years, you have Christ setting up the eternal kingdom. There'll be a new heaven. This earth is going to be dissolved, Peter says. The elements will melt with a fervent heat. I believe while that is going on, while God is preparing a new heaven and a new earth, that this great white throne judgment takes place somewhere in the universe. I don't know where. It says heaven and earth fled away and there was no place found for them. Now, that is when it occurs, just before the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with a new heaven and a new earth is established. The Bible said in that passage of Scripture that they were judged according to their works. You say, well, Reggie, you get up there and you say, well, Lord, I was taught evolution down to schoolhouse. And God is going to say, but what did the Bible say? You may get up there and say, well, I thought all religions led to heaven. And God is going to say, but what did the Bible say? You see, you're going to be judged by this book. I'm telling you this morning, you're going to be judged by what's in this book. You may say, well, Lord, I was told by the church. And God is going to say, but what did the Bible say? You're going to say, but I heard Reggie preach this. And God's going to say, but what did the Bible say? You may get up there and say, Lord, or our denomination believe this. And God's going to say, I don't care what your denomination believe. What did the Bible say? Uh, somebody's going to say, well, Lord, I told you if I'd get baptized, I'd be saved. And God's going to say, what did the Bible say? And when you stand before God, it's not going to be what you thought, what other people said. It's going to be judged by the books. There were books were open, and they were judged out of those books. Sixty-six books God said you'll be judged out of. You may get up and say, well, Lord, the church is full of hypocrites. And God is going to say But what does the Bible say? You're going to say, Lord, I thought this. And God is going to say, it's not your thoughts or not my thoughts. What did the Bible say? You're going to say, well, Lord, I figured this. And God's going to say, it's not what you figured. It's what does the Bible say? You may say, Lord, I went to church. And God is going to say, but what did the Bible say? And let me tell you what the Bible says. You must be born again. You must be born again. You may say, well, Lord, I was told there was no hell by my family, or by my church, or by my group. And God is going to say, but what does the Bible say? Somebody may say, well, like a man told me one time, uh, they may say, well, Lord, I was told that death ends it all, and you're just in the ground. And God is going to say, but what does the Bible say? It's appointed unto men wants to die. And after this, on the other side of death, judgment. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to give you just a few things here. And we'll be done. Number one, you see in this passage of Scripture in Revelation chapter 20, you see a summons, but you see no resistance. I received a summons one time to appear in court. And you know what? I didn't want to go. And you know what they said? They said, Reggie, if you don't go, we're coming after you. I I had a, a call one time to be a witness in some case over in Texas County. I mean, I was busy. I didn't want to go. You know what? They called me up and said, Reggie, if you don't get over here, I'm sending def- deputy after you. I don't care what you're doing today. Let me tell you something about this call. The Bible said in death and hell delivered up the dead which are in them. There is a summons to appear at this court and there's nobody not going 
that God calls. There is a summons and no resistance. You're not going to say, well, Lord, I don't feel like going to court today. You're coming. Second of all, there is a call and there are no exceptions. There are no exceptions. Death and hell delivered up the dead which are in them. Can I say to you today that Christ calls you to repentance today and he calls you to faith in Christ. And you can refuse him today and you can say, Lord, I don't want to. But in that day when God calls, you cannot refuse. There is a call and there's no resistance and there's no exceptions and there's no refusals. I want you to notice thirdly that there is a judge and no jury. God needs no jury to find the evidence of our guilt or our sin or our crimes against heaven. You don't, they're not, by the way, there is a judge and no advocate. Nobody there to stand up for you and say, wait a minute, I want to tell you some, another side of the story. They can't hire a lawyer and twist the story around, twist the evidence around. There is a judge, but no jury and no advocates. God doesn't need anybody to tell him the truth. God doesn't need anybody to bring out the facts. God knows every thought that you and I have had. God knows every word that you and I have said. God knows every attitude that you and I have had. He knows every motive that we've ever had. He knows every deed that we've ever done. And God doesn't need a jury. And God doesn't need an attorney to bring all of that out. God is all-knowing. God knows everything. He said every thing will be brought into judgment. There shall be nothing hid, the Bible said repeatedly. There is a judge but no jury. There won't be any jurymen that you can look to with hope and pity and, and, and a, a pleading for mercy. There's no one calls this case but God Almighty. There is a prosecution, but there is no defense. The Bible said, what certain things the law saith? It saith to them that are under the law. That's why you better get out from underneath the law and get under the cross. That every mouth may be stopped. You get up there and sputter like a welding ark to God and I'll tell you some angel is going to walk up and slap your face and say, shut your mouth. You've lied. You know you've lied. You've committed adultery. You've thought thoughts. You've hated. You've done all that garbage. You're, don't, don't come up here at the judgment of God and act like you've never sinned. Don't come up here and act like my son. God may say to you, don't come up here and act like my son died for nothing for your sins. You know what you're saying when you reject Jesus Christ? That you don't need him. That he died in vain. I want to tell you something. If you think God the Father is going to let you get by with that, with having disregard, how, watch this verse. How, of how much more sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant an unworthy thing. You know what God is saying? Of how much more punishment do you think those people who said Christ died in vain and shed his blood for nothing? I'm telling you, I'm so sick of all the news commentators and the jack legs around this country. They wouldn't know the truth. They're afraid to mention the name of Jesus Christ. Truth has fallen in the street. Nobody thinks they're going to judgment. They've got a God carved out that likes everything they do. This country's full of idolaters. But I stand behind this pulpit this morning. If this is the last message I'll ever preach to you, there's a God in heaven. And you and I are going to stand before him. We're going to give account of our lives. It's not a play thing. I tell you, woe unto the pastor who gets behind the pulpit and strokes the, the, strokes the necks of his parishioners every week and speaks smooth things to them and never warns them of the judgment of Almighty God. I like to preach on nice things. I, I like to preach on marriage and raising children and the practical aspects of Christianity. But that does not take away the fact that you and I are racing down a track like a train headed to judgment. There is a prosecution and no defense. Where's the devil now? Where's the devil now? Can I tell you, he's where you're headed. He's already been cast into the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 10. And he's already there. And he's standing down in the bowels of the lake of fire waiting for you to be cast down there. Where's the devil now? Where's, where's the people at now that nodded their head and went along with your sin and your rejection of Jesus Christ? There's a prosecution here, but nobody is going to defend you. There is the dead, but there are no living. By that I mean it's only the lost people, no saved people. 
There are no saved people at this judgment, only the lost. As I said, we may be there for witnesses. I am fear that I may be called to witness. Reg Kelly, did you preach such and such on such and such a day? February the 7th, 2016, did you get up behind the pulpit and warn those people that if they did not repent of their sin and believe on my son, the Lord Jesus Christ, did you warn them of the lake of fire? Did you warn them of the great white throne judgment? You see, God is a just God. He doesn't just arbitrarily throw people into the lake of fire. There's going to be a cause. And you're going to hear the evidence. There is a sentencing and there is no appeal. Now I want you to think about this. You just read about the real Supreme Court here. This is the real Supreme Court. You don't go any higher. You can't say, God, I'm going to appeal your decision. There's no place to go. There is a sentencing, but no appeal. You can't fire your lawyers. You don't have any to start with. You can't say, I'll go hire a good legal team. There is a sentencing, but no hope. No hope. No hope. Somebody said if you could hear the wails of hell this morning like a fire, what you'd hear is no hope. No hope. No hope. There's no hope. I do not know of two words that's more sad to hear from the human mouth than the words, no hope. There's nobody to appeal. I'm before the the throne of the universe. I'm before the God of justice. I'm before God Almighty. There's nobody higher than him I can go to. There's not only a sentence but no appeal. But there's a second death but no second chance. I think one of the meanest things the Roman Catholic Church has ever done is teach people purgatory. That's mean. That's mean. To tell people that they're going to some type of a hell, but you can get prayed out. That's a lie out of hell. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care if your grandpa's a Roman Catholic priest. He's a stinking liar, and God's going to hold him accountable for his lying to people and sending people to hell. I'm going to tell you right now, it's not funny to lie to people about their soul. I don't care how they pat you on the head. That's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Somebody tell you you're going to purgatory. There ain't no such thing in the Bible. Let me tell you what I'm telling you here today. There, there, is a, there is a second death, but there's no second chance. You're not coming out of here. You go to the lake of fire, there's no record about anybody ever coming. In fact, the Bible said in 20 verse 10, forever and forever. I want you to think about this morning. There's a second death, but no second chances. I have often thought the worst thing I could ever conceivably go through my mind is to think that the moment I die, I die lost. And all of a sudden I'm in hell. Oh, God! The thought that would get me is that I'll never, ever be able to be saved. All I have ahead of me is the bringing it out of hell to the throne of God. And all I have ahead of me is hearing the just cause why I ought to be in like a fire, separated from God forever with no hope and thrown and cast. That's a word that God's word uses, cast into the lake of fire. Why does he use that word? Because nobody is voluntarily going to jump off into the lake of fire. I want you to see the scene this morning. There is a casting, but there is no retrieval. If I were to get somebody up here this morning, Ezra, you're just handy here, but would you help me just a second? Let's say that this young man was standing at the judgment seat of Christ, at at this great white throne of judgment. Philip, I want you to come up here for just a second. Tim, I want you to come up here for a second. Kenny, I want you to come up here for a second. I want you to put something in your mind. I want you to ever get over this. He's his dad. And I believe that the last thing he'd ever like to have in his mind that this boy went to the lake of fire forever and ever. But let's say today that he was there at the great white throne judgment and God said, your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. Whosoever's name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And God said, cast him into the lake of fire. I believe that Philip would grab him. But you talk about angels. Mighty angels come. Can you imagine your son being pulled out of your arms, taken away from you and cast into the lake of fire forever and ever? Can you imagine? I had a dream one time, and I don't put no stock in dreams, but this is the honest truth. 
I dreamed one time that I was that the devil was dragging one of my children to hell. And I was I was screaming, I was pulling on the legs of my child. I was trying to get over their body. And it's like they pulled him out of my hands and put him through the doors of hell. And these great big iron doors just shut. And I remember collapsing on the ground and weeping and crying and saying, They're gone, they're gone, they're gone. I can't imagine. Listen, I don't like preaching this stuff. But you can't blind yourself to the Word of God. Thank you, guys. You may be seated. Listen to me this morning. There is a casting and no retrieval. I'm telling you this morning, listen, we need to get our heads out of the sand and realize that this thing is serious before God Almighty. And if we have any heart, my son said something to me. How are you doing? I said, I'm burdened. You can't preach a message like this without being burdened. The old prophet said, the burden of the Lord. And it's like all week long, I've, I've known I was going to preach this for a week and a half. And it's like all week long, Lord, is there something else I can preach? Lord, is there something else I can preach? I don't like to preach these heavy messages. Lord, I don't like to think about hell. I don't like to think about somebody being thrown in the lake of fire. But God says, Reggie, it's in the Bible. People need to be reminded and preached of the Word of God. There is a judgment and there is no mercy. There comes a time in your life when the door of mercy is shut. Now, I'm telling you something. You can believe this or not. But on January the 28th, 1982, with 13 and straight years of Sunday school attendance under my belt, as an unsaved churchgoer, it's like the Holy Ghost came. I was sitting three seats from the back. It's like God said, Reggie, I've dealt with you for a long time. You've heard it over and over again, and I've spoke to you in the quietness of your own life. I've spoken to you at church. I've spoken to you out in the field. I've spoken to you driving down the road. And you have rejected my salvation. It's evidenced by the life that you've lived. And Reggie, tonight's it. The door of salvation closes tonight. Now you listen to me. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I don't care whether people likes it or not. All of us need a good old-fashioned dose of the fear of God. The Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And if God says that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, then brethren, let me tell you on the authority of the word God's word, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's why people carve out gods that are not living because it's not a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a God you've made in your mind but to fall in the hands of this God will be another matter there is a judgment and there is no mercy I believe you can literally have the doors of mercy shut on your soul sitting in a church house I believe with all of my heart that night if I would have said no to the Holy Ghost God would have shut the doors of mercy I'd have walked out that door I'd have got in my car. Karen and I would have went home. But I believe it would have been over for Reg Kelly. I believe the doors of mercy. You say, Reggie, you believe that? Yeah, I believe that for me. I don't know about you, but I can tell you one thing. The door of mercy somewhere is going to shut for you. It may be at death. It may be that last. <gasps> and the door of mercy shuts. I want to ask you this morning. Are you positive? based upon not how you feel, but upon this book, based upon the witness of the Spirit of God in your life, that you're saved. Can you know assuredly by the the peace of God in your heart, I'm not going to wind up at the great white throne judgment based on what Jesus did for me. Can you say that today? If you can, that's something to get on your face and thank God about. That's something to thank God about. Finally, I believe there'll be prayers and no answers. Let me tell you why I believe that. In Proverbs chapter 1, God said, Because I called and you refused, I will laugh at the day of your calamity. He said, I stretched out my hand, but you had not of none of my reproof, none of my counsel. And he said, I'll. Then you'll pray, and I'll not answer. 
I believe there'll be people at this good. Oh, God. Oh, God, please, just one more chance. Lord, I didn't mean to. God, I didn't. Lord, 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 please. You don't read about anybody getting no prayers answered. Nobody's, God changed, God's mind's not changed about anybody. You see, God is not fickle. He is not like us. He means what he says. And he will go through with what he says. And that's why the Bible says, the Lord is long-suffering to us, word. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I wonder this morning, can you say with an honest heart, I have come to repentance. I have come to faith in Jesus Christ. And based upon this book, I expect to be with the Lord when I die. Jesus said, you have one that judges you, the word. And it'll judge you at the last day. He said, if you don't receive me and don't receive my words, there's nothing left for you but judgment. Now, I'm going to be honest with you today. I understand why preachers don't preach on this anymore. It is not popular. It will not draw crowds. But it's the truth. I want us to bow our heads as the pianist comes this morning. I want to tell you this morning, I'm not here to play games with you. I'm not here to play fiddle. I'm not here to fiddle with your soul. I tell you, I can tell you straight up, friend, that if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't preach this. If it wasn't in the book, I wouldn't preach it. God, it's no wonder that God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that he repent. But I think it's good for us. I stared at this passage of Scripture this week. I stared at it. And the old fleshly doubt in my soul said, God, is it true? Is this scene true, Lord? Lord, will multitudes and multitudes be cast into the lake of fire? Oh, God. The answer came, Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. And the answer came, and the truth shall set you free. I want to ask you a question here this morning. It won't hurt you to take an honest assessment, an honest evaluation of your spiritual condition. Can you honestly say today, Brother Reggie, the best I know, I have, I have placed my trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. His death, His burial, and His resurrection for the forgiveness of my sin and for the salvation of my soul. And I am clinging to nothing else. And when I die, I will die in the expectation that God does not lie and that to be absent from the body I will be present with the Lord, not based upon how good I've been, not based upon how much I've served or worked or gave or anything else, but based upon Jesus, what Jesus did for me alone. And Reggie, upon that basis of trust in God's word, I do not expect to be at the great white throne judgment. And I bless his holy name for God's sweet mercy and for his goodness. In my home, you know, think about this. Did you think about this phrase? It said there in that passage of Scripture, there was no place found for them. Think about this. Jesus said in John 14, he said, for those that trust him, he said, I go away to prepare a place for you. Mm, mm, mm. You say, Reggie, best I know from the Word of God, I'm saved. I'm going to ask you to do so. I don't do this real often, but I'm going to ask you to raise your hand to that effect and thank your Heavenly Father. Would you just raise your hand and say, Lord, I want to thank you, Lord, for saving me that I'm not going to the lake of fire, that I don't have to stand before this judgment, that I'm in Christ and I trust him alone. You may put your hands down. Now I'm going to ask you something. Now you listen to me. I'm not after your money. I'm not after your praise. I'd like to be a friend to you but I don't have to be. 
But I do want you to go to heaven. And I don't want you to go to the lake of fire. If you couldn't raise your hand this morning, but you'd like to be able to, and you want to, you want to be saved, but you're not, what I'm doing right now is just trying to lead you to Christ. I want you right now, if you would, if you couldn't raise your hand, would you please pray with the earnestness of heart, dear God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me of my sin in Jesus' blood. Lord, I turn from my sin and I receive Christ as my Savior. I'm going to believe on Him for my salvation. I'm going to trust Jesus right now that He died for me, that He was buried to take away my sin, that He rose to give me eternal life. And I'm going to receive Him and by faith I'm going to trust Him and I'm going to receive Your grace and Your mercy right now. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm telling you right now, listen to me, friend. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not kind of, not might be, not hope to be, shall be saved. And let me tell you what else. God gives you eternal life. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. He'll give it to you. And that life lasts forever and forever and ever. And I'm preaching to you a gospel this morning of eternal life in Jesus Christ. I'm preaching to you biblical salvation. And I'm telling you something. Anybody ought to want to tell somebody else good news. And the good news of the gospel is you don't have to go to the lake of fire. You don't have to wind up at this judgment. You can be saved. But if you walk out of here this morning not saved, it will be because you have willfully turned away from God. And I don't know what's left for you. And Jesus told those people in John 12, there's nothing left for you but judgment. But you know what? You can be saved right now. Now you listen to me good. You're thinking about, you're, you're, you're struggling right now in your spirit and your heart. The devil's going to lie to you. He's going to tell you all kinds of junk. You cast his lies out of your mind right now. And you say, I'm going to believe God. It doesn't matter what the devil's throwing him. I'm going to believe God about Jesus Christ and about my sin. And I'm going to be saved. And I don't care who likes it, who don't like it. It matters only what God knows and God says. And I'm going to ask you right now to call on him in your heart. Say, Lord, save me, please. God, he said, he'll in no wise cast you out. He'll in no wise cast you out. He will hear. He will save. He'll pass you from death and life. He'll save you instantly. Would you pray right now? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I place my trust in Jesus Christ. God said the faith of a child, the faith of a mustard seed, that's all you need. Dear Lord, I pray right now that in the quietness of this moment that there'll be a great work done of the Holy Spirit in birthing people into the family of God as they call upon you. Oh, Lord, I pray, take this message. Go places I'll never be. And Lord, use it for your glory, we pray. As our heads are bowed and eyes closed today, I want to ask you this question. Have you prayed? Now, listen, I'm not asking you to make some kind of scene or we're not here to embarrass you or make a spectacle out of you at all. That's not our goal. But if you've asked the Lord to save you today, I would like for you to lift your hand up high so I can at least acknowledge that you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Would you lift it up right now? Amen and amen and amen. There's three, there's four, there's five, there's six, there's seven. God bless you. There's there's eight. Anyone else this morning? There's nine. God bless you. God bless you there. This is God's work, not my work. This is, that's how I want God to do it. Is there others this morning? I want to give it to Christ this morning. I want to be converted to Christ. I accept him now as my savior. God bless you there. I see that hand. You may put it down. God bless you, sir. Our father in heaven, we see these hands and we can only see the hand. You see the heart. But I really don't believe, Lord, these folks would be raising their hands if they didn't think, Lord, that they were serious about it, Lord. And so, Lord, to say, I pray that, Lord, you'll comfort them now to know that, Lord, you don't lie to nobody and you don't play games and you don't leave them in some kind of shrouded cloud of mystery. 
Lord, that you would do what you said you'd do. You'd save them. That you'd give them eternal life. That you'd prepare a place for them in heaven. God, help them now that they believed on Jesus to walk with him and just trust him. And Lord, to know that you don't lie to nobody about nothing. And I pray right now, God, that you'll guard them against the lies of the devil. And that they'll recognize them and cast them down. And they'll, Lord, seek your face and believe your word. Lord, I thank you today for saving people. I thank you, Lord, for a good response. I pray, Lord, you'll do far greater and far farther, Lord, than even this church house today with the message. Lord, we do love you for saving us. Lord, when I think about my family and myself, Lord, that we could have all been headed to the lake of fire had it not been for the grace of God. Oh, Lord, we could have been stumbling along in the darkness of this world just hoping things worked out in the end. God, thank you for the glorious light of the gospel that was preached to me. God, help us to carry it on to others. In Jesus' name I pray. Now listen to me. If you're here today and you've raised your hand and you'd like to visit with me or anything, listen, what you need to do now is you need to follow the Lord and believers' baptism, all right? You need to get baptized. We've got a baptistry right down here. And uh, you say, we want to get baptized next Sunday. You let me know this week. My phone number is 746-4242. You can look it up. And let me know we'll have a baptism. I'm going to, listen, I didn't save you. I can't keep you. God saves you and keeps you. But I will tell you this, if you'll be in church, and you'll grow. You'll grow in the Lord, and God will help you along. So I ain't going out and bug you in no way, shape, or form. But if you got saved and you want to talk to me about it in any way, shape, or form, I'll tell you, if you got saved, be in church tonight, be in church next Sunday, and get on the road with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Follow the Lord and believe it. That baptism won't save you. You're getting baptized because you did get saved. You're identifying with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we made a happy day. The Bible said there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repented. And we made the devil mad today, and I'm glad. So let's stand this morning and sing that old song. Oh, say, but I'm glad.